online and here in the sanctuary. Welcome to worship with Trinity Reformed Church. We are a community God gathers, transforms, and sends to share Christ's expansive love with the world. If you are new to Trinity, we invite you to scan the QR code in your order of worship or grab a welcome card at the Welcome Center. Either way, you can share your contact information and sign up for our weekly email. A few announcements to highlight this morning. Next Sunday, we will have a potluck after worship, and the theme of the potluck is chili cook-off. You're invited to bring your best chili dish and or vote for your favorite chili at the potluck. The maker of the chili that receives the most votes will win the traveling trophy and be able to display it in their home until our next chili cook-off. Two Sundays from now, we'll begin a three-week series of intergenerational second hours. Sometimes we hear intergenerational and think it's for children or it's for households with children. But by intergenerational, we mean all the generations. To be intergenerational, truly, we need full generational participation. So whatever generation you are in, hear this as a personal invitation to attend the intergenerational second hours. Your presence is needed to strengthen the bonds that knit this community together. We hope this will be the kind of event where children sit with people not in their household. Uh, we hope this will be the kind of event where people of all ages experience learning and formation. We hope this will be the kind of event that is a highlight uh, for many of us as we move through this year focused on earthkeeping. So two Sundays from now, plan on starting to attend a three-week series of intergenerational second hours. Our winter spring book is Refugia Faith, and there is a reading guide available for you at the Welcome Center, so you can pick that up after worship, and it has some great discussion questions and thoughtful uh, notes throughout the reading of the book that you can use. So we'll pick one of these up today. Finally, a reminder to nominate people for the upcoming consistory elections. There are paper forms on the table in the back of the sanctuary. There's also the online nomination link in the weekly resources tab of the website, and it's working very well right now. If you're hearing these words, you are invited to complete a nomination form. All forms are due in two Sundays, so if you are deadline motivated, you might be feeling the motivational level increase because we're starting to draw close on time. Our introit song today is number 527 in our red hymnals. We'll sing verses 1 and 2 of Come Away from Rush and Hurry. I invite you to rise in body or spirit as God calls us to worship. All who are thirsty, 
come to the water. All who are weary, come and find rest. All who yearn for forgiveness, come and be set free. Let us worship the eternal God, the source of love and life, who creates us. Let us worship Jesus Christ, the risen one who lives among us. Let us worship the Spirit, the holy fire, who renews us. Let us praise the name of our God together. Our gathering song is Thirst No More, the songs in our order of worship. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who was and is and will come again. And all God's people said, Amen. I invite you to be seated. In God's presence, we become aware of our need for transformation. We ask God to begin that transformation by praying our prayer of confession. Let's pray together. O oh God, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. But we don't know how to rest. We have been distracted by many things. But we don't know how to stop moving. We are worried and anxious. But we cannot find peace. Slow us down, Holy One. Calm our breath 
and open our eyes, that we might know you as our resting place and find our peace in you. Amen. Hear these words of assurance from Psalm 116. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord protects the simple. When I was brought low, God saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. And having been forgiven in Christ, may the peace of Christ be with you and also with me. Let's share a sign of that peace with one another. Sorry, it took me a little while. If there are any other children that want to come forward, I think we've got everybody. All right. Are we ready to sing our prayer? Connor, are you ready? Okay, let's pray. Be still and know that God is here. Be still and know that God That God is here everywhere. All right. If you are going upstairs to Children in Worship, you can follow Miss Amanda. And if you're remaining here in the sanctuary, you can turn in your order of worship to our song of preparation, Lord Have Mercy. Just 
Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 8 through 11, and then also chapter 23, verses 10 through 13. That starts on page 58 of our Sanctuary Bibles. We're going to read a couple of passages where God gives instruction to God's people around Sabbath keeping. Let us listen now for the word of God. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Now, chapter 23, beginning at verse 10. For six years you shall sow your land and gather in its yield, but the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, so that the poor of your people may eat, and what they leave the wild animals may eat. You, should, you shall do the same with your vineyard and with your olive orchard. Six days you shall do your work, but on the seventh day you shall rest, so that your ox and your donkey may have relief. And your homeborn slave and the resident alien may be refreshed. Be attentive to all that I have said to you. Do not invoke the names of other gods. Do not let them be heard on your lips. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Our second reading comes from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 10. We'll read verses 38 through 42. That's on page 845 of our Sanctuary Bibles. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a certain village, where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part will not be taken away from her. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Be still, slow down, breathe in, breathe out, and know that God is God. A couple of weeks ago, when we were all snowed in, one of my friends sent out a group text checking in on everybody and seeing how we were coping, confined to our homes with our families for so many days in a row. And one of my friends, a busy mom of three, responded and she said, I have to admit, it's been kind of nice being snowed in. The kids slept over in my room, we baked bread together. We watched a Disney movie. It sure beats hauling everyone around to their activities like a normal weekend. I was struck that for my friend, it took a blizzard 
to force some rest. The third virtue in our Epiphany series of earth-keeping virtues is serenity. Stephen Boma Prediger defines serenity as an unruffled peacefulness, an inner calm amidst the chaos. It is the relatively rare ability to remain undisturbed by the raging seas that surround us. To be clear, serenity is not apathy or indifference to the chaos, but rather a nurtured assurance of God's grace trusting that God is continually at work in the world, ordering the chaos, mending the broken, reconciling the alienated. And that trust allows us to go about our living and our earthkeeping with calm assurance, rather than fear, anxiety, and desperation. Serenity does not come easily to us. When we read the stories of the sisters in Bethany, we resonate with Martha. There is so much to be done. There is bread to be kneaded and vegetables to be chopped if we are going to get dinner on the table. There is laundry to be scrubbed. These men have been on the road for weeks. They need new clothes. There is so much to be done. There are neighborhood parks to be restored to their natural beauty, litter picked up, and playgrounds refreshed. There are creeks and waterways that need to be restored, floodplains replanted. There are global temperatures that need to be lowered. There is legislation that needs to be changed. There is so much good work that needs to be done. Serenity does not come easily to us. In so many parts of our lives, in our paid employment, in our household and family work, in our earth-keeping efforts, even often in what we consider our play, so often, like Martha, we are worried and distracted by many things, often good things, but we lose track of the serenity God has for us. Be still, slow down, breathe in, breathe out, and know that God is God. We might think that this is a particularly modern problem, as the wheel of our lives keeps moving faster and faster, as technology continues to pick up speed. And that may be true, and yet it also seems that since the very beginning, serenity has not come easily to God's people. Why else would God need to command the people to rest? In the 10 best ways to live, God tells God's people that taking time to be still, to slow down, to know that God is God and we are not, that is as critical to flourishing as not murdering our neighbors. And this stillness, this rest, it is critical not just for the wealthy and powerful who can afford to take the time, but also for those who are as yet free from the weight of societal responsibility. Your sons and your daughters, your children need rest. Live in such a way that they might rest. And also, maybe particularly, those whose labor goes unnoticed or undervalued, but who are probably all the more exhausted because of that. God tells God's people, your male and female slave, your resident alien, those on the margins, the outsiders, they need rest. Live in such a way that they too might rest. 
and not even just humankind, it seems. God says, you rest so that your livestock, your ox, and your donkey might find relief. Live in such a way that the animals might rest. And not even just the animals, but the land itself, God declares, needs rest. For six years you shall sow your land and gather its yield, but on the seventh year the land needs to rest. Live in such a way that the land might rest. God knows serenity does not come easily to us. And so God commands rest for all of creation. You can sing along if you want. Be still, slow down, breathe in, breathe out, and know that God is God. In the novel, Jaber Crow, Wendell Berry tells the story of two farmers. The first is Athy Keith. Athy and his wife, Della, farmed 500 acres of land near the Kentucky River. They raised tobacco and corn, followed by wheat or barley, and then clover and grass. They had cattle and sheep and hogs and mules to do much of the work. Their land also contained what Athy called the nest egg, about 75 acres of mature forest, oak and hickory, beech and birch, red maple, yellow poplar, even some loblolly and shortleaf pine. It was the finest stand of trees in all Kentucky, and Athy logged it only for firewood, discerningly and knowledgeably, so that the forest was healthy. Because Athy knew that if cared for wisely, that beautiful forest could flourish for a long time. Now, Athy and Della had one daughter named Maddie. And when she was 21, Maddie married Troy Chatham. Handsome and intelligent and with great aspirations. He would farm more land and make more money than any farmer in north central Kentucky. He would become a famous all-star farmer. As they all grew older, Troy took over more and more of Athy's farm. He borrowed money to buy a new tractor, which allowed him to work more land. He soon was working at night, planting corn on land rented on a neighboring farm. He bought ever more powerful machinery. He pushed the land to produce more corn. Troy hired consultants to figure out how to get more out of the fields. When Athy died and Troy gained complete control of the farm, the rate of change increased. Trees flanking the fields were bulldozed, and every bit of plowable land was sown in soybeans and corn. Hogs came to be the only livestock, and they were kept in the barn. When one morning, the rumble of large machinery echoed down to the river. And Jaber Crow, the town barber, was down fishing, and he heard the sound and went to investigate. As he rounded the rise, he saw bulldozers clearing Athy's prized nest egg. Enormous logs like beached whales were stacked side by side. Every tree big enough to make two-by-fours was being cut to the ground. When Jaber sees all that Troy has done, he describes him not as an industrious worker tilling the soil and gathering the yield, not even as an all-star farmer making the most of his land. Jaber saw Troy as a man who had given everything and did not even know it, who had worked himself and the land to death. Friends, we too are parts of systems that do not allow creation the rest that she needs. 
Our eggs come from chickens that live under artificial lights, extended daylight designed to keep those chickens laying more eggs more of the time. Our beef comes from cattle who have overgrazed stretches of land so thoroughly that the grass there can no longer regenerate. Our food grows in fields filled with chemical fertilizers designed to meet our consumption needs. But much of that nitrogen becomes poisonous nitrates in the earth's soil and water and air. Serenity does not come easily to us. Now, God does not teach the people to rest because work is an evil drudgery, and we need to endure it only until we can finally stop. This is not God's version of everybody's working for the weekend. God tells the people to rest so that they might learn the holy rhythm of creation, of work and rest. Of work, not the means by which we gain power and control, status and wealth, Good, holy work, expressions of God's image within us that are reflected and shared with the world. Good work and good rest. Rest as a living reminder that we are not capable, nor are we responsible for doing all the good work that needs to be done in the world. Good, holy rest. A time set apart to recognize, to remember, to celebrate what God has done in creation and what God is doing even now. Our rest is a living reminder that God is God and we are not. That God is at work in the world. It is in rest that serenity is nurtured within us, trusting in God's work so that we might know peace even amidst the chaos. Be still, slow down, breathe in, breathe out, and know that God is God. Old Testament professor Dr. Travis West invites God's people to enter into the holy rhythm of work and rest by imagining time differently. Not time as a line composed of an unending sequence of moments that we can cut up into fractions of seconds to increase our efficiency and productivity, but instead to picture time, perhaps like the Sabbath mandala in the back of the sanctuary you may have noticed as you entered today, or something like a flower. Imagine a black-eyed Susan, he writes, with overlapping and interlacing petals, all connected around a center from which they grow and from which their vitality and stability and perhaps serenity flow. Perhaps time is composed of overlapping loops that converge in the center where God dwells. Perhaps in our times of holy rest, we return to the center, to God's grace and to our primary identity, not as productive workers, but as God's beloved children. Like Mary, we experience serenity when we rest at the feet of Christ. Be still, slow down, breathe in, breathe out. And know that God is God.
people of God in this busy, distracting, and anxious world, I wonder, I wonder how you might nurture the earth-keeping value of serenity within. Perhaps you might begin with that old-fashioned, ancient practice of weekly Sabbath-keeping. Not just a day of burdensome rules and regulations, but a way of finding regular time for rest, for refreshment, for restoration. Or perhaps you might carve out five minutes a day to be still. Maybe in the morning, so that you might present your day before God and open yourself to the ways God might work through you. Or maybe right before bed, so that you might entrust all you have done that day and all you have left undone that day to God before you sleep. Or maybe you'd want to do those five minutes sometime in the middle of the day. Five minutes to reorient yourself in the middle of that chaos. To be reminded of the serenity we have in our God. Or perhaps you might want to choose one thing in your life. One task. One responsibility. To put down for a time. See how that feels. I wonder how you might nurture the earth-keeping value of serenity within. And I wonder how we might live in such a way that all creation might find the rest she needs. Perhaps you might start with a small garden to connect with creation and supplement your use of industrial agricultural systems. Perhaps you might look at your purchasing patterns, using less so that we might require creation to produce less. Perhaps you might convert a portion of your yard from lawn to native plants or make a way station for pollinators so that they might rest in their holy work. People of God, serenity does not come easily to us. But the good news of the gospel is that the same God who created all things at the very beginning is even now actively working to restore and to redeem all things. We are invited to join in that good and holy work And we are invited to rest in the peace of that good news, to experience serenity in our God. Be still, slow down, breathe in, breathe out, and know that God is God. Amen. I invite you now to rise in body or in spirit. For our song of sending, it's number 370 in our red hymnals, My Soul Finds Rest.
you to be seated. Our great prayer of Thanksgiving this morning is found on the orange inserts in your hymnals. If this is your first time celebrating communion with us here, you're invited to follow those around you as we come forward to receive the elements and return to our seats. If you wish to remain in your seat, just raise a hand and a server will bring communion to you where you are. Please know that all who seek to follow Christ are welcome here at Christ's table. Let's begin our great prayer of thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Broken, wandering, lost, 
of all creation. In Christ, you became embodied in the world to redeem all that you have made. Send your Holy Spirit upon us now, that this bread and this cup, the fruit of the earth, may be to us the body and blood of Christ. At supper with his disciples, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. After they had eaten, Christ took the cup. And he gave it to them, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Great is the hope of all creation in Christ. The hope of the ends of the This is the bread of life given for us. Let, Let all who hunger come and eat. This is the fruit of the vine poured out for us. Let, Let all who thirst come and drink. These are the gifts of God. For all of creation. Let us come for all things are now ready.
A couple of new requests before we begin our prayer today. The first is for prayer for Reuben, the Swanson's grandson, who uh, fell and had some staples to help uh, heal up his head. So we pray for continued healing for Reuben. And uh, Norm Cansfield, whose General Synod trial was the spark that uh, started Room for All in the RCA, uh, passed away this week. So we want to remember Norm's family in our prayers as well. Let's go to our God in prayer. God, thank you for giving us serenity and letting us rest at your table. You offer us a meal we did not work to receive. You give us time to be together without competition. You give us freedom from the burden of productivity. This bread and this cup is the grace of your life. We give you thanks for calling us into existence so that we might share our delight in you. As we depart from this table, we offer you back our lives, our gifts, our offerings. Sanctify all of our time and all of our efforts so that our lives are about more than our own survival. Make us participants in your reign and signs of your renewal. God of the Sabbath, bring new life as we rest in you. We ask for rest and release for all those held captive by cruel governments or suffocating theologies. We pray for Israeli hostages and Palestinians fleeing the violence of war, for Ukrainian civilians targeted by missiles and soldiers enduring the battlefront, for victims of human traffickers and those living under oppressive regimes. God of the Sabbath, bring new life as we rest in you. We ask for rest and release for all those held captive by grief that crushes or memories that paralyze, by loneliness that pierces or hopelessness that deadens. We pray for those enduring physical ailments or mental illness, for those suffering addiction or overwhelming anxiety. We pray for those loved ones on our hearts, for Jim Friel as his feet and legs heal and he longs to return to his apartment, for Keith Harris as he moves carefully and exercises diligently, waiting for his back to heal, for Derek Coombs as he continues to recover and reconnect memories. For Jane Zavidil, 
Brenda Heemstra and John Kederberg as they long for deliverance and renewal. For Reuben as he heals and recovers. For the family of Norm Cansfield as they mourn his death. God of the Sabbath, bring new life as we rest in you. We give thanks for the signs of rest and renewal we already see among us. We celebrate Florian Sullivan feeling better and being able to return home. We celebrate the fun and adventure of the youth group's retreat at Camp Henry. We celebrate Dale Hulst being with us again to help us live into our role as earth keepers. God of the Sabbath, bring new life as we rest in you. O oh God, who gives us life and rest and serenity, from the dawn of the first day, you have cared for your people. By your hand we were created, in your hand we live, and to your hand we return again. Help us to live by the rhythms of your Sabbath and bring new life for us and all of creation as we rest in you. Amen. Our song of sending is number 430 in our red hymnals. So I invite you to rise and body your spirit as we sing, You Are Mine. of 
reminder that you're invited to join us for Adult Second Hour after coffee. Dale Hulst is with us again this week, and we're going to be talking about some ways that we might do the good and holy work of advocating for creation. I invite you to raise your hands as a sign of our unity in Christ. And now, as we go from this place to work and to rest in the serenity of God, we go with God's blessing. May the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen. <laughs>